I hope that you're ready to embrace the night as we get comfortable and let the darkness take control. About 10 years ago, I was working as a private investigator. It sounds cool, but it actually isn't. You spend about three to five hours each day driving to your cases, stake them out in a blazing hot car with the engine off for eight hours, and then spend one to three hours in a hotel room writing up your reports before finally getting some sleep and doing it all over again. I did this job for about a year after completing my training to be a medic in the army reserves. I was young at the time, so the idea of making 50k a year and travelling all over the country whilst living out of a suitcase seemed appealing to 19 year old me. As I said before, you spend a lot of time driving around in areas you're not necessarily familiar with. On one of those late nights, I found myself driving onto a twisting mountain road, just outside of Taos, New Mexico. The area was heavily wooded with narrow roads that curved sharply, without a lot of places to turn off, since you were driving up and around mountains and forests. In the middle of the night, as I manoeuvred my rental vehicle through a curve, I saw a woman stumbling along the side of the road carrying a small child. The sight caught me off guard and sent a shiver down my spine. It was so unexpected and so out of place. There were no houses nor buildings around me and it was around 2am and pitch black. This unnerved me, but what sent the shiver down my spine was the way she moved. She lurched along with what I can only describe as a shuffle, straight out of a George Romero zombie flick, and she didn't look up or acknowledge me as I drove by. She just stared aimlessly at the road in front of her. You have to remember that I was 19 years old and fresh out of a year of extensive army training. I was in peak physical shape, and I thought I was Billy Badass at the time. I had spent a month working in trauma centres as part of my training, so I still don't often get freaked out or scared, but seeing this did scare me. I drove on for a minute or two thinking about what I'd just seen. Who was she? What was she doing here this time of night? How did she get here? The more rational part of my brain took over, and I came to a horrifying realisation. I had been driving for about a mile and a half past her, and I hadn't seen any homes nor businesses, nor had I come across any places to turn off since I had seen her. And it had been about ten miles since I had come across a place to turn before I saw her. This wasn't normal. Something was wrong. I realised that she had to be hurt or in trouble. Perhaps she'd been in a car accident and was in shock. What if the child she was carrying was hurt? I was a medic. I had trained for a year to help people. Sure, I was scared and unnerved. But how would I feel if they later died of exposure out on the mountain and I was too much of a coward to go back and help? Wouldn't I also be scared the first time I saw combat, when my friends were depending on me? I had to man up and turn around. And as soon as it was safe, I did so. I drove back to where I'd seen her, half relieved and half horrified when I could not find her. I traced the road a half a dozen times. Where could she have gone? There was only a small area on the side of the road and guardrails for miles. I drove, turned around and drove, and turned around and drove, and turned around and drove again. I was obsessed with finding her. Part of it was out of concern for her child. Part of it was proving myself that I was doing the right thing, even though I was scared shitless. After a while, however, it became about me proving it to myself that I wasn't actually going insane. 
I spent hours looking for her. Eventually I stopped my car and started walking along the road, looking for any signs of her or any disturbance on the mountain, to indicate that a vehicle had crashed off the road and down a mountain. I walked that entire three mile stretch of road in pitch black with a flashlight, at times yelling like a madman, listening to every twig and echo with bated breath. I didn't even care about my deadline or my next case. I was sure of what I saw. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't seeing things. And I wasn't overly tired. I saw her stumbling down that road. And there's no doubt in my mind. But there was nothing. Even when the sun came up and I drove to the stretch of road again half a dozen times, there was nothing and there was no way for me to explain it, even after countless sleepless nights in the ten years since devoted to it. I don't believe in ghosts. I saw this bullshit documentary and laugh away their evidence and stupid orbs like the rest of you do. But I also don't know where the hell the stumbling woman and her child came from, or where they went. So, on the off chance that you were stumbling down a windy road in Taos, New Mexico about 10 years ago with a toddler in your arms. Please, tell me what happened, where you came from, where you went, and that you are both okay. I've been puzzled for a decade now. I used to date a guy called Norman back in high school. I'm 29 now, and have a 9 year old daughter. So this must have been at least 12 to 13 years ago, roughly. I guess we were each other's first real love slash relationship. And we even wore promise rings, which was a pretty big deal back then. We talked about getting married and what our life together would be like. Basically, things people say or do when they've been together for a year as teenagers. As things go, we began to argue and fed into a cycle of breaking up and getting back together. I was immature and stupid, and I ended up getting together with another guy during one of our breakup periods. It became a messy love triangle situation, and Norman and I finished for good after I chose this other guy. Not my proudest moment, but I was 17 and stupid. Fast forward a few years, I made a Facebook account, and out of curiosity one day, I looked up Norman. We added each other on Facebook, and I messaged him, apologising for what had happened between us. I was happily married by the time, and had just had my daughter. Norman was a good sport about it, and we remained amicable friends via social media. I really only ever spoke to him to say happy birthday, or randomly comment on a status. Another few years go by, and Norman gets into a relationship with a woman called Marissa. I was happy to see him moving on. My marriage didn't work out, but I was happy with my life and raising my daughter by myself. During Christmas one year, I found an old Polaroid picture of Norman and I that we took during a cabin weekend that we had taken together whilst we were dating. I messaged him and recalled how much fun we'd had. He didn't reply, and this was before those scene stamps. I later found out that I was no longer on his friends list. A few months later, I got a message from Marissa. She basically said that I was a whore and a slut, and that she saw the message I had sent months ago. She told me to never ever contact him again, and that I needed to get over him. She went on to say how a charm bracelet he gave me was nothing compared to what he buys her and that I was just a cheap shag he had during high school. She said the silver promise rings were bullshit and that he had bought her a gorgeous golden engagement ring with several diamonds. Well then, I never responded. I got off Facebook not long after for a short period of time before remaking an entirely new profile and adding only close friends and family. Over the next few years, I would get ads from people who I didn't know on my social media. I knew it was her, because the first account that I mistakenly added 
began to send me abusive messages, saying I was a loser, and a slut, and an attention-hungry whore, who would never find true love. Afterwards, I never added anyone else I didn't know personally, so I don't know how she kept finding my other accounts. She tried to add me to Instagram, Twitter, and even somehow found out my phone number and tried to add me on WhatsApp. When Snapchat became a thing, I got an ad from a user who had one of my Facebook friends' names as their username and sent me snaps of whore and bitch in cursive handwriting on paper. I kept blocking her and maintaining no contact because honestly, there was nothing else I felt I could do. This year I joined a dating app. I met a guy within the first few weeks of being on it, who I thought was amazing. His name was Nate, and he had a fair few pictures of himself. He was average looking, so it didn't raise any red flags with me that this suspiciously model looking guy was trying to talk to me. He said he had an Android phone, so he couldn't FaceTime, but we would speak on the phone regularly. It was definitely a man's voice. We texted a lot over the next few weeks, and things seemed to be going well enough for a meetup. We scheduled a time and a place a week beforehand, and he asked me about past relationships. I didn't think too much of it when he asked me about my first real relationship. He seemed keen on details, and asked me if I still had feelings for my ex. I reassured him that I didn't, but that I also didn't hate him, because I was the one who messed up and he was actually a really good guy. We talked a lot about that relationship, and then he said that he was really looking forward to meeting up with me. We had chosen to meet in an outdoor cafe, because I didn't like the idea of meeting someone at my house without me actually knowing who this person was. I was so excited. It was my first online date in a long time. So imagine my confusion when I saw a woman spot me and smile and started walking over. I was too shocked to say anything when she sat down, and yes, it was Marissa. She looked so smug and said, Hey babe, and just kept on smiling and confessed that it had all been her. At that point, I honestly just wanted to know why. What did I ever do to this chick to get all these reactions from her? and for her to actually invest her time in doing all of this for me. Basically, this is what she told me. Almost six years ago now, when she and Norman got together, he told her all about me and our first relationship. She went onto his friends list and saw me there, and then went through all my pictures and posts, trying to see what he saw in me. Then when I messaged him, she confronted him, over why I had any pictures of me, and him, still, and why he needed to have me on Facebook. So he deleted me and promised to never speak to me again. She told me that she hated me, and said that I was a stupid bitch, who loved playing with people's emotions, and that she wanted to give me a taste of it. She said that she made up accounts, so that she could just keep an eye out on me, and make sure she wasn't going to be in the same city as her and Norman. She would walk by places I'd say I'd like to go to, to make sure I wasn't meeting up with Norman in secret. She knew where I worked through my LinkedIn, and she said the guy who I spoke to on the phone as Nate, was her friend who was in on it, and wanted to see me go down. She said she had originally planned to make me fall in love with Nate, and then cheat on me, but she couldn't stand to wait so long. The most disturbing part, however, was when she came to my daughter. The woman had actually become extremely fixated on her, and she was convinced that she shared some of Norman's features, and became obsessed, thinking that I had a kid with him who I'd kept secret. She told me not to even think about suddenly revealing it to him in some ploy to get him back, because she would be the only one to give him a baby. I was beyond horrified. It's not very exciting at all, but all I remember was getting up from the table and telling her to never contact me again. I got in my car 
and just sat there in silence for a bit. The first thing I did was call my daughter's school and alert the front desk of a possible situation where someone who was neither I nor her father would try and pick her up. I called my brother afterwards and told him what happened. He urged me to call the police. I did, but ended up getting the whole spiel about how if I didn't have any documented proof about her saying these things, they couldn't help me. It's been two months. I haven't heard anything from her, and my brother thinks that maybe she got what she wanted by asserting herself as Norman's one and only, and now she would leave me alone. Still, I have massive paranoia when it comes to what I post on social media and where she might be lurking next. I've told my family and close friends about the situation and warned them not to add any strange profiles or people that they do not know. I told my neighbours about the situation and showed them a picture of her so that they could call the police if they saw anyone like that around the house. I wouldn't put it past her to know my address and start peeping in our windows, or worse. I've also changed all the locks as a precaution, so Marissa, let's not meet again. It was 2001, and my friend and I were both 17, and driving back from a late movie to my house one night. I lived in a pretty rural area in Maine, about 20 minutes from the nearest town. As we were driving down the highway through the woods, we passed a median with a car sitting in it, facing in the oncoming direction with all its lights turned off. Right after we drove past it, it flashed its lights, did a three-point turn, and began driving behind us. We giggled that, oh, it must be a gang initiation. We're going to get murdered. Because this was Maine, and that obviously was not happening. The turn-off for my road was a few miles away, and this car stayed behind us the whole time. We made the left turn, and the car kept going down the highway. Phew. But 30 seconds later, we realised that the car must have backed up on the highway and made the turn after us. Now we were getting a little worried. There was still one more road to turn down before we got to my house and this was way in the woods, and the car did the same thing, backed up and made the left after us, and now we were legit freaked. I had a long driveway, and the car followed us right into the driveway and almost up into my house, which had all the lights on because my mother was home. We ran into my house just in time to see the mystery car reverse back down the driveway and drive off. To this day, we still have no idea why the car was following us, if they thought that we were someone else, or if they actually had bad intentions and only changed their minds when they saw that my house lights were on. Since we only ever saw the front of the car, we never got a license plate, or any better description other than a blue car. One particular instance stands out the most as the most unnerving thing that I've experienced. It's one thing to see a warning sign about a predator in the area, and it's another thing to be stalked all day. I went out one afternoon on my small jong boat to do some fishing in a swamp, mainly for warm mouth. I was pretty familiar with the area, I motored about three to four miles to reach my favourite spot. Alligators are fairly commonplace out there, and it's just something you become accustomed to. Generally, if you respect them, they'll respect you, as they've become pretty used to fishermen. The water in the swamps are full of tannic acid from the decaying leaves on the bottom, so the water looks inky black at first, and visibility is only a few inches. Anything that is visible just under the surface is tinted a dark amber colour. 
I had caught a few fish and noticed that around 50 to 60 yards back up the canal, a pair of eyes were floating just above the water and pointing in my direction. It was a gator, no big deal. They've learned to become more opportunistic and steal stringers of fish if you leave them hanging from the side of boats. I continued fishing for a few minutes and had just reached down over the side of the boat to grab the lip of a warmouth that I'd hooked. As I pulled the fish out, I saw the faintest glint of amber in the water, about a foot below where my hand had just been. I watched as the faint glint slowly rose upwards towards the surface of the water, revealing two black eyes and the largest jaw on a gator that I've ever seen in the wild. I slid back into the centre of my small jump boat as the head of the gator broke the surface. I could feel its back sliding along the bottom of my boat, shifting it slightly. After watching it for 10 to 15 seconds, it finally swam out from under the boat. I'm guessing it was pushing 12 to 13 feet, and that's after having seen hundreds of gators. This gator followed me for the rest of the day. I'd always motor a bit further away just to put distance between us, but not long after I'd stop, I'd feel that familiar bump on the bottom of the boat again. Each time, it would eventually just swim off a few feet and turn to stare at me. I've never felt more outmatched. This dark, quiet, toothy bastard had the ability to sneak up at you at any time it pleased and get within three feet of you before you even knew it was there. Do you know how unnerving it is to look at something in the eye that makes it abundantly clear that it's only waiting for you to make a mistake? There's a level of intelligence and focus in those eyes that makes you understand your place in the food chain. It's not the first time gators have followed me. I've been followed by three at once before, but none have ever made me so intimately aware that the only thing on its mind was to drag me out of my boat and under the surface of that black water. A friend of mine was a state trooper and had been for years. He had been part of a bus that involved 30 stolen IROC Camaros. He had changed tyres for people and caught a guy doing 130 miles and then tried to pay his ticket with cash. Caught a .31 DUI. He has seen a lot. One night, he pulls over a guy who was swerving a bit. He didn't really suspect DUI, but he wanted to be sure. He pulls him over and calls in the plates and goes to talk to the guy to get his license. As soon as he turned around, the guy pulled a gun and got out. My friend turned back to find himself staring down into the barrel of this guy's handgun with no way out. He soon learned of this guy's warrants and how he wasn't going back. The guy got him down on his knees and the guy kept talking for about a minute and then goes to execute him. He pulls the trigger with the gun held to my friend's head and it jams. The gun doesn't go off. He quickly subdues the man and arrests him. The guy is lying on the ground crying. My friend gets back up and this guy goes to prison. He was never able to return to patrols. He would freak whenever he had to pull someone over and it ended his career. Years later, he went to prison to meet the guy and forgave him for what he did that night. I guess... It was to get closure. About 12 years ago, in a suburb of Baton Rouge, there was a suspected serial killer on the loose. The running joke in our store was that it was one of us because the murders were happening in and around the delivery area. There was a very dodgy motel by a remote industrial complex right off the highway. Everyone hated having to deliver there, 
because it was mostly truck drivers, pimps, hoes and druggies, and none of them tipped. I got stuck going there at around 11pm on a Friday night. As I approached the room, I could see the door was open slightly. I knocked and said hello, and there was no answer. Through the crack I could see a person sitting, so I nudged the door open a little. It was a frumpy middle-aged naked woman tied to a chair, blindfolded and gagged. She nodded as if to acknowledge my presence and turned her head in the direction of the nightstand. There was a note and some money on it. I scanned the room and didn't see any signs of anyone else, i.e. the person that tied her up. I read the note, and it was something in the lines of, This is our 20th anniversary, and it was my fantasy. Please look all you want, but don't touch, and keep the change. P.S. My husband is hiding and watching, so don't try anything. There was a $20 tip. I thought for sure this was my last delivery I'd ever be making. I snatched the money and left the pizzas on the bed and backed out slowly. I had never been more creeped out in my life. Unfortunately, there was no murder at that hotel that night. I stopped delivering pizzas shortly after. Back in 1987, I was sitting in a class and had the most intense and vivid daydream I have ever experienced. I was sitting in class looking at the clock, when the next thing I know, I am walking through a mall with a woman who I'd never met. Everything about the dream felt so real, so tangible. The smells, the tastes, the overall experience. I was an adult, and I knew that she was my girlfriend. As we were walking and talking, some guy started shooting people randomly, but before I had a chance to react, I felt something like a punch to my chest. When I looked down, I was standing over my own body, with a pool of blood spreading around it. I watched the chaos of the scene unfold in real time. My girlfriend was all over my body screaming, and I was trying to comfort her. I watched the police neutralize the shooter and then the other emergency workers cleared the scene. I watched them remove my body, and I tried to follow, but I was unable to leave the mall. I haunted the mall for a few years. As a spirit I was bored, so I would mess with the security guards during the night shift. During the business hours, I would try to interact with the customers. Every now and then, I could get someone to nod hello, or walk around me and we wouldn't collide. I remember an elderly man sitting on one of the benches and having a heart attack. He was standing over his body, so I walked over to comfort him. I had an overwhelming feeling that it wasn't his time to die. And so I told him. He sank back into his body as the emergency workers were resuscitating him. One day I was sitting on one of the resting benches, and a young boy about the age of six or seven sat down next to me. He began talking to me, and when he did, I felt something strange happen. I knew I was to leave with him. I became his invisible friend. His name was Brian. He was an only child of a single mother, and she was an abusive alcoholic. I helped him survive life. I taught him not to talk to others about me, so that they wouldn't think that he were crazy. I experienced being with Brian for years. When he was about 10 years old, his mother came home drunk. She went into a drunken rage and hit Brian, and I lost my temper, 
and I was able to slam her into the wall. She never hit him again. I watched him grow up into a teenager, and when he was around 18, I knew that my time with him had come to an end. We said our goodbyes, and just like that, the daydream was over. I looked up at the clock startled, and perhaps a minute had passed. I had experienced just short of two decades of existence as a ghost in a minute of time. I used to work security, and several years ago I was assigned to a remote construction site where a summer camp was being built. It was quite literally in the middle of the woods, roughly four or five miles into the forest with only a single access road that they'd been using to haul equipment and supplies and such. My job was to provide overnight security, doing a foot patrol of the entire area. The patrol covered around two miles roughly once every hour, and then going back to my post, which was a tiny wooden shack not much bigger than a payphone booth to fill out my logs. Other than the occasional black bear, coyote or bobcat, it was a very boring assignment, with one exception. I was doing a routine patrol one night near the end of my shift, around 3am or so. I just passed the gate, where the access road enters the site, when I heard an extremely loud piercing scream that seemed to have come from a distance down the road. It sounded like a woman screaming in absolute terror, and at this point I need to clarify. I hear bobcats pretty often around my house, and encounter them occasionally whilst working in remote areas. They definitely have a distinctive and creepy scream but there is absolutely no way that this scream was a bobcat. I immediately took off sprinting as fast I could in that direction. I didn't hear anything else after the initial scream, but about a quarter of a mile down or so, I came upon a car parked just off the side of the road. There was no car in sight when I'd come through on my way to my shift, so it had to have been parked there fairly recently not running and with no lights on, and no doors open nor anything. I called out to see if anyone was there, but got no reply. I looked around the general area, and didn't see anything. Needless to say, I was pretty goddamn sketched out at this point. I ran back to my post, and reported what I'd seen to the local police, since there wasn't really anything else I could do. Unfortunately, nothing ever came of it, I've never found out whose scream I heard, or what caused it. The car was apparently owned by a guy who lived in the area, but I never heard why he was there. My supervisor suggested that maybe I'd heard a mountain lion or another animal screaming, but I've heard those animal sounds before, and although they're definitely freaky, there's no mistaking an honest-to-God human scream. I arrived in at work at 6am, and finished work at 10pm. The previous night, ended up running into an assault on an old man on his way home, and my commute was about an hour, so instead of getting home around 11, I got home around 11.45. I have a quick bite with my wife, and go to bed around half midnight. Three hours and 45 minutes later, I woke back up because I had to be in work for 6.15. I'm on station duties and a man comes in and says that he thinks his wife is missing. He's very sketchy on details and I'm just having to drag information out of him. Basically, they had a fight. She stormed out and didn't come home that night. I checked her on the system and she's a respondent for a couple of domestic violence orders. I dig a little deeper, and I discover that they're actually against her son, rather than her husband. I am very, very tired and a little cranky. I look at the bare information I have, and send the chap home to wait for his wife. 
I check the hospitals on our own system to make sure she hasn't been arrested. And local fire and ambulance services. I circulate her details to all units in the city and record the incident. I have done enough to cover my ass, and technically, there isn't anything else for me to do for a while. I go and get a cup of coffee, and all I wanted to do was sleep. But something didn't sit right with me. I was suspicious of her husband. He seemed as if he were hiding something. I went down to my skipper and asked him if I could go to the house and have a look around and maybe talk to the husband again. The skipper isn't delighted about it, because it means he'll have to cover the desk because we're short-staffed. But he agrees like a trooper, and off I jolly well trot. I arrive at the house and speak with the husband again, and ask him if I can have a look around. There may be something that might shed some light on where she may have gone. I have a scout around the house, and find several containers of pills with weird names. After a quick Google search, I discover that this woman appears to be on a cocktail of antidepressants, mood stabilizers and other stuff. Oh, and I found an insulin kit. I ask her husband about these, and he mentions that his wife has some emotional problems. But I didn't think it were relevant, and put it to him that there is a lot of medication here, and ask if she has more than one insulin kit. He goes pale at that point. She'd left all her medication at home. I ask him where she keeps her purse, and we ended up checking her bedside locker. Her purse is missing, but I snag a framed picture for future reference, as I currently had no idea what this woman looked like. I ask him if I can search the room, and he's beginning to completely break down at this point and tells me I can do whatever I damn well please, and storms off into the living room. I am feeling distinctly queasy at this point, to say nothing of a banging headache from sleep deprivation. I don't find any suspicious holes in the wardrobe where she may have taken clothes, or any secret stashes of drugs or cash. I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I search the bed. I turn over his pillow, and there's a note underneath it. It's a suicide note, explaining in no uncertain terms that she is intending to end her own life, and that she can't go on, and that she's sorry for being a burden. I radio the station and update them. I then have to walk down to the living room and tell this woman's husband that he had been sleeping on her suicide note overnight and never noticed. That was probably one of the hardest things I've ever been called upon to do, are dealing with dead children. I found her eventually, though it took another eight hours. We pinged her phone to a nearby town, but that just gave us general locality. I put the town to her husband, but he said that she didn't have any friends or family there. And after 15 minutes, he calls me back to tell me that they spent a weekend there shortly after they got married. I called the hotel they stayed in on that occasion, and they've got no one by that name. So I went down in person and showed them a picture of the lady. The person at the desk told me that a guest answering to that description had just left on a walk to the pier. I went out to the pier, and found her, and we had a bit of a chat. Nothing dramatic. She told me that I looked awful, and I just said I was very tired. I asked her to give life a chance for a few more days, that her husband loved her, and that she wasn't a burden. She agreed, and we brought her home. A couple of days later, she came into the station with a box of chocolates and a card that read, Thank you, for not letting me kill myself. That's when I realised how close I had been to just letting the matter rest, because I had ticked all the boxes on the list. I went to the toilet at the back of the station, and threw up for what felt like an hour. She sends me the same card 
every Christmas. During my freshman and sophomore years of college, I was extremely awkward. I had just come out as gay. I didn't have any friends and I was just generally kind of a big wad of social anxiety. Given that I didn't have any social skills to make new friends, it's not surprising that I literally had no dating experience. Miraculously, over the course of the summer after sophomore year, I just sort of grew out of the worst of my awkwardness. I lost some weight, had a lot more confidence in myself, and my self-esteem was a lot higher. I came back to school in August, and by October I had a decent amount of genuine friends, and had gotten a lot more involved on campus. With my newfound confidence, I decided I'd finally download Grindr, and see what it was like. Now for anyone who doesn't know, Grindr is a gay dating app that is primarily used for finding sex hookups. Despite my recent improvements on the social arena, I was still extremely naive and inexperienced when it came to dating and sex. I set up my Grindr profile with a nice picture of myself and a very brief bio. I got a lot of messages very quickly after my picture being approved. One guy who messaged me had a display name of dad for young which should have been my first red flag, but I was oblivious. I should note that I also look really young for my age. At the time I was 21, but I was regularly asked by campus staff which middle school or high school I was visiting from. I'm 23 now and I still get asked if I want the kids menu if I go to a restaurant with my parents. It's bad. So, dad for young sends me a message that just says, what's up? And I reply without looking at his profile first. I then look at his profile and notice that he's 54. His only profile text says, the younger, the better. And his only picture was a zoomed in blurry picture of his hairy chest. So I was not very much interested. But given my inexperience, I thought ignoring him would be horribly rude. So I kept replying. I don't really remember what we talked about in the first 10 messages we exchanged, but I do remember telling him that I was very cute. I know I told him that I was a student, but I never mentioned which college I went to. It's important to note that I went to a college in a major city and there's also a bunch of different colleges all within a 5 mile radius of each other and a few more within 10 miles of those. Sort of like Tinder, Grindr works based off your location, but much more precisely. If you're less than a mile or two away from someone who's online, it will display their feet in distance. I noticed that dad for youngs profile said he was 25 miles away, which I thought was kind of far. He started getting more sexual in his chats and asked if I wanted to meet up. I felt bad flat out denying him since he'd been so polite. I told him I didn't want to meet up with him that day, but that we could keep chatting if he wanted. I figured that that was that, and when I checked 20 minutes later it said he was offline. Nope. About 30 minutes later, I got another message from him. Hey, I got a wild hair, and thought I'd have a nice drive out to Canterbury campus. I had not told him the name of my college, nor had I told him the part of town I was in. I looked at his profile, and now it said he was three miles away. I started freaking out a little, and didn't reply to his message in hopes that he would just leave me alone. It's important to note that my college had a couple of different campus chunks separated by a few miles. I lived on the upperclassman residential campus, which was around two miles from the main campus where all of the other student dorms and the main buildings were. I felt like if he were going to try and find me, he'd go to the main campus first, then maybe give up since not many outside people know about the separate residential campuses. Five or six minutes later, I got another message saying something like, 
No fun if you don't play along. What building on the residential campus are you in? His profile now said that he was over 2,500 feet away, and every time I opened his profile, the distance would decrease. I was fully losing my shit at this point, since this guy had the ability to pinpoint my location, so I shut my blinds and turned off my lights and locked my windows. My roommate was also out of town, on some kind of retreat, so it was just me. The door was already locked, and I was getting worried. He kept sending me messages every minute or so saying things like, I'm gonna find you. Here I come. And other supremely creepy shit like that. The distance was now just down to 310 feet, and I was completely losing my mind and didn't know what to do. So I just deleted my whole profile. Nothing else happened that night, though I was absolutely terrified he was going to come knocking at my door. Fast forward to three days later, I decide to re-download Grindr after doing more research and seeing that you can adjust the settings so that my exact location is invisible. When I logged on for the first time to my remade profile, I adjusted some of the search filters until the results were specific enough to display dad for youngs profile, which I promptly blocked. Later that evening, I get a message from someone with the display name, We'll find you, with the same gross profile picture as dad for young and my stomach sinks as he sends a flurry of messages. You screwed up. Almost got caught by the police because of you. Couldn't find you, so I had to go to the other dorms and find someone else. He ended up calling the cops for me. I'm not giving up. I'm coming for that sweet virgin asshole. Freaked out, I blocked him again. Deleted my profile again and then deleted Grinder. I refused to re-download it or any dating apps for about a year after that. At which point, I worked up the courage to try again and have not heard from this nut job ever since. So terrifying old man with a fetish for young inexperienced guys? Please, let's never meet again. Only once when I was fishing did I have a ghostly experience. And that was when I was fishing at a lake in France. I'd been there for a couple of days and my time was really nice and peaceful. There was an old chateau nearby riddled with bullet holes from the Second World War. Anyway, this lake is on a French army training area, so it was pretty secluded, and during the late afternoons, I had the feeling of being watched from the woods on the far end of the lake. Each day at the same time, the feeling would return, usually around dusk, and from different areas as whatever it was got closer. I remember walking on the last night of my trip, outside the bivvy. It was very foggy, and I could hardly see the dim glow of my bite alarms. I decided to make a brew. As I flicked on the lighter, the sparks silhouetted the face of a helmeted German soldier, peering into my bivvy from the darkness outside. The next morning I packed up and went home, but not before speaking to an old French estate warden, who told me that the chateau had seen some fierce fighting when the Americans liberated that area of France. The Germans had fled into the woods, only to be ambushed by a patrol in reserve. They were all killed and buried around the lake. I don't think I'll fish there again. This happened when I was 11. I still remember it as if it were yesterday. My grandfather was getting old, and had been in and out of the hospital a few times that year. At the moment, he had been in the hospital for about two days. We had gone into the hospital to visit him, where I gave him a big hug and told him that I loved him and would see him tomorrow. That night, I went to bed and had the most beautiful dream. My grandpa came into my room and sat in the rocking chair in the corner. He invited me into his lap, and he told me he was going away for a while, and that someday, he would see me again. I shouldn't worry because everything was going to be okay, 
and he was no longer in any pain. I smiled at him, and gave him a big hug and told him that I understood. I then looked over at my brother sleeping in the bunk below me, and asked my grandpa if we should wake him and tell him. When I turned back to get a response from my grandpa, he was gone. I ran to the window to look out into the front yard, and he was there waving at me. He whispered, Go tell your mum and dad exactly what I told you. I looked back at the door to my room, and then back to the front yard, and he was gone. I immediately woke up, ran to my parents' room, and turned on the light. I told them exactly what grandpa had told me. They told me it was just a dream and to go back to bed, and I told them again exactly what grandpa told me. Again, frustrated, it was 2am, and they told me to go to bed so that we could speak about it in the morning. Just that moment, the phone rang. It was the hospital, and my mother started sobbing. Grandpa had just passed. At that moment, she just sat there with my father staring at me. I still remember their faces. They both looked at each other, then at me, then each other, and finally smiled and stopped crying. They gave me a big hug, told me that they loved me, and to go back to bed. They ended up going to the hospital that night, and my aunt came over to watch us. But we have never spoken about that night since. I lived in a handful of different apartment communities with my mother for the majority of my teenage years. Some better than others, and incidentally this occurred in the best of all of them. I was 16 at the time, and there were a group of girls around 10 years old that liked to hang out and play volleyball together a lot. They hated me, because they used to go around with another kid and throw water balloons at them whilst they were playing. In hindsight, this was pretty creepy in itself, but at the time, it was hilarious. Well, I'd probably be the last person they would ever visit, but one day, whilst I was playing GTA in the middle of summer, they came knocking at my door. I was going to make a smart-ass comment, but they looked pretty distressed, so I asked them what was wrong. They told me that there was a weird guy driving around near where they were hanging out, and wanted me to come by. I was the oldest kid in the complex, so it made sense that they would come for me. We went and got my buddy who was 14 at the time, and we went over there. Well, they were right. We got over there and there was this guy in an old truck, still there, watching us approach. I was pretty fearless, so I flipped him off and started throwing a football with my friend. The girls went back to playing volleyball, and this is where things get absolutely crazy. After around 10 minutes, the guy gets out and starts walking towards all of us. We decide to get the hell out of there, so we run back towards my place. He follows. I tell everyone to book it, and he starts running behind us. At this point, I decide I'm going to go get my mother's gun and scare this guy away. So he beat him back to my apartment and locked the door. I get the gun, unloaded, and go back outside to find that he's there waiting for us with a nasty look on his face. I look him dead in the eye and tell him to get the hell out of here and point the gun right at him. But he smiles, reaches into his belt and raises his own gun right back at me. It's at this point that I completely shit myself. I know I can't fire. I went completely numb just standing there, gun raised for what felt like years, when in hindsight it was probably no more than 15 seconds. Neither of us said a word. After that eternity, he finally lowered his gun and walked away. We called the cops after and omitted the part about my gun, but they never found the guy. I have not pulled a gun on anyone after that. I was the neighbourhood badass forever after the encounter though, but absolutely did not want the designation. I didn't sleep for weeks. I can still clearly see the barrel of that dude's gun staring me down. 
I felt like the smallest dude in the world for those 15 seconds. My mother trained as a nurse at the old Westminster Teaching Hospital in London in the 1950s. On one of her first night shifts, she was doing the rounds in the children's ward. Everything was fine. All of the kids were asleep. But in one of the rooms, she found the sink faucet running, which was a bit weird, because it had been fine when she was there only a few minutes before. She figured that one of the kids must have gotten up and been thirsty or something, turned it off, and carried on with the rounds. When her shift was over, she was checking out with the matron, who asked if she had anything to report. She said that there was nothing, except that someone had left a faucet on in one of the rooms. The matron looked horrified. She then explained that the ward was haunted by a ghost which washed its hands, leaving the faucet running whenever a child was going to die. My mother laughed this off and pointed out that none of the kids in the ward were seriously ill and went home. When she came in for her next shift in the evening, she discovered that a previously perfectly fine child in that room had had a sudden seizure and died only a few hours after she had found the open faucet. I am a Christian. I am a member in our church choir and I was around 10 or 11 when this happened. In our church every Sunday morning, we have breakfast in the church quarters. It has a beautiful ocean view. The dining hall is on the front, and on the left-hand side are the priest rooms and rooms for the other church people. Our meals were always prepared by this one cook. He was a great guy, or at least that's what I thought back then. His name was Al, and back then, he was in his late 30s or early 40s. The thing with Al was that everyone thought he was gay. Or at least, he pretended to be gay. The way he spoke, the way his mannerisms were, they all indicated that he was quite feminine. So no one suspected him in any way. One day, there was a fiesta in our neighbourhood, so people were everywhere. I enjoyed biking around the area, and today was one of the days where I found myself doing just that, and I was wandering around the back side of the church, and there he was. I was sitting in a chair watching me. He called me to come inside the church quarters. He was all alone, and I didn't ring any alarm bells in my head, because we never had any stranger danger classes here, and because I just thought he was a nice guy. Not to mention that nothing bad has ever happened here. He invited me in, and I was led to his room. I don't remember how or why I was inside, as this was ten years ago. But what he did next is something I will never forget. He locked the door. I was scared, and his happy tone then changed to a quite sinister one. He walked towards me slowly like a predator making its way towards its prey. He laid me in bed, and touched my ten-year-old thigh up and down. I was starting to cry now, and I told him that I just wanted to go home as I didn't understand why he was touching me in this way. He asked me how much it would take to kiss me. Silent tears streamed down my face, and silent pleas to let me out. He did. He opened the door and we left. He sat me on the top of his lap for about 30 minutes, just nuzzling my ears on that chair for his entertainment. And then he let me go. Needless to say, I never went back to church. I really regret never telling my parents about it. I can't believe how stupid I was back then. A few years later, I was informed that he died in his sleep. At least he will never harm another girl's life again. 
I've been a cop for a while now, and this is one of the calls that still haunts me. I get a call for a domestic assault that has just occurred, and I learn that the victim is at the neighbor's house. I get there and find the female victim's throat has been cut from ear to ear. The neighbor is holding a towel up to her slit throat and the victim is struggling to breathe. The paramedics are on their way and I take over holding the towel for the neighbor. I'm trying to apply enough pressure to reduce the bleeding, but not so much pressure that I am strangling her. I want a delicate balance. Quick law lesson. You know that there are laws against hearsay, right? Basically, I can't testify in court about the events that someone else has told me about and that I didn't witness. The person who witnessed it would have to testify to it. One of the exceptions is what's known as the dying declaration. If someone is on their deathbed and believes that they are about to die, their statements are exempt from the hearsay rules. I have some serious doubts that this woman is going to live. I want to ask her who slit her throat. In order for it to qualify as a dying declaration, I need to be able to testify that she believed she was about to die. So, I ask her two questions. The first, who cut your throat? Which she answered. The second was, you realize that you may be about to die. To which she answered, yes. Our eyes locked. And I still remember the emptiness in her eyes. Within a few minutes, the medics showed up and my partner and I went next door to look for the suspect. The door was ajar, and we could hear a baby screaming upstairs. We went in with guns drawn, and a metallic smell of blood was overpowering. We made our way upstairs, past smeared bloody handprints on the walls, and found the child. He was unharmed, and the suspect was long gone. Thanks to the excellent performance of the medical star, the victim survived. I met with her a couple of weeks later, and I was apprehensive to speak to her again. I had basically looked at her and told her that she was going to die. When she opened the door, I could tell that she didn't recognize me. She had very little memory of what happened after she was assaulted. I told her who I was, and she hugged me, crying, and thanked me for saving her life. The suspect ended up pleading guilty, so I never had to testify as to what the victim had told me that night. It still haunts me to this day. I worked in the California Avenue after Buena Vista Street opened in Disneyland. One night I was cleaning the shelves in trolley treats when the locked automatic doors just opened. Now normally I wouldn't think anything about it, but two fellow cast members behind me, just checking out the cash registers, just stopped and stared. I asked, did those just open on their own? And they both nodded. I shrugged and continued my work. About 10 minutes later, it did it again. This time I was alone. I got down and checked the door, but it wouldn't open even for me, so no idea what caused it at the time. I mentioned this to my lead, who told me that the whole trolley treat site and the old Burbank ice cream shop were haunted by a little girl who died in the parking lot when the DCA wasn't even a dream. She apparently liked messing with the boys and would tease male leads closing up by running up and down the aisles late at night. One day, I was walking to work, and all of a sudden I had an urge to walk a different path than usual. I work downtown in a big city. It was a strange spur of the moment urge to walk a different way that changed my life forever. 
I turned into an alley that I had never seen before. As I remember it, I made it about 15 feet or so in, when an actual glitch happened. Everything in my mind scrambled. It felt as if I didn't have a body anymore. Just that I was a semi-conscious entity, floating through some weird dimension. All of a sudden, in the array of different colours and shapes, a vision came to me. It was a bunch of strange-looking people, that in my mind resembled businessmen in suits. They looked startled and panicked that I could see them. One of the people made a quick movement, and everything turned to black. When I regained normality, I was on a completely different street. It was on the same street that I always used to walk to work. I felt sick and severely disturbed. I'd never done any hard drugs, never experienced any hallucinations, and have never had anything like this happen to me. The weird thing is, when the glitch was correcting itself, and I could see those people watching me like a caged animal. I had the feeling that I knew that I was being controlled. It still bothers me very much to this day. When I was 10 years old, I had a really freaky thing happen to me at my house. I woke up in the middle of the night, really thirsty. It was around 1 in the morning and the entire house was dark. I got out of bed and went downstairs to get a drink. Conveniently, my mother had just gotten up to do the same thing. We head downstairs to the kitchen for some water, and right when we got to the kitchen, a car randomly pulled into our driveway, and a man got out. My mother and I are standing in our kitchen as we watch him very aggressively start coming towards our door. He was wearing a hoodie and black gloves, really big burly dude. Right before he reached the door, my mum flipped on the light. Since the entire house was dark, he couldn't see us, but we could see him. The instant the light flipped on, he stopped, looked right at us, and ran back into his car and hauled us out of the driveway and down the road. We never saw the guy again, and I don't know if he was trying to break in or what he was planning to do, but I had nightmares about it for weeks. Scared the shit out of me. My two buddies from the war and I go about twice a year on a weekend long fishing trip. We catch up on our lives, rent a cabin and the usual, but this year happened to be one when my buddies were sick, so I told my other friend about it, and he told me that his cousin was in town and that he could fill in. So we took off to our spot. Once we got there it was late in the afternoon, but we had enough time to set up our gear and head down to the boondocks. Among some of the things that we took with us, there was a weather slash emergency radio, just in case of an emergency. We set it up on any FM frequencies, and chill out until we catch something. Between us talking and getting to know more about my friend's cousin, the radio started to make a crackling sound which it had never done before. Then the radio mysteriously switched from FM to AM, which I thought was weird since it had a little button on the side that you needed to press in order for it to change. We called it an we called it a night, but my friend's cousin looked distracted. He kept looking at the lake and smiling, and there was also a hint of fear in his eyes. When we got to the cabin, we headed towards the kitchen, because we all heard a loud noise. All the dishes had been thrown onto the floor, and my radio was making the same strange sound. My buddy's cousin comes up and tells me, don't worry, it's the spirit of the man who lives here. He just doesn't like you guys coming here. I looked at him puzzled, and my friend later explained to me that he's a medium. I wasn't much of a believer, but now, things have changed. 
Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I don't know if you can hear it, but I actually have a cold. I'm just hoping my voice is better for tomorrow. Doesn't look like you guys were really in the mood for beach nor let's not meet stories in the last few days, but I do have some really freaky stories on there. So I'll leave the links on screen so that you can check them out after. They're seriously creepy and I know you'll like them. So go on. And if you enjoyed today's video, please consider dropping a like and leaving a comment. It would really help me out with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks guys. And if you want me to read your story on my channel, you can submit it to me as a text post on Reddit or send it to me via email. Both links can be found in the description. And if you'd like to do something truly amazing today to help support